This episode has been brought to you by Flowstate, the unlimited web flow development service. Find out more at flowstate.dev. And now introducing Flowstate Go, a one-shot development consultation. Okay, right, I hope you appreciate this because I was packed and ready to go. I'm moving to a new location today and I'm getting messages and people want my opinion on the new web flow updates to particularly the bandwidth and some of the some improvements they've been making and to be honest i do have a few thoughts it's something that i wish i alluded to in the episode i literally released yesterday after two weeks of not releasing anything so you get double whammy this week but i wish i'd mentioned it because i alluded to this idea of where webflow is placed just to check my mic in amongst the slew of no code tools and Honestly, for me, it's starting to get really, really muddy. So let's start from the top. Basically, they are telling us how great they are, what they've given us, and fair play, they, they really are. They're delivering very, very quickly, and they've given us some amazing new features uh, to be able to build marketing websites, and specifically marketing websites, because they don't really acknowledge the use of Webflow by uh, using tools like Wizd and stuff like that, but I think that's another subject altogether. But they really do, they butter us up here, and they start to tell us about the reference fields and collection items. Now, I think it was Emily who messaged me, who, who tweeted me, when I made a comment on Twitter, yes, they're increasing reference fields, but that to me is useless unless you're able to support those reference fields inside of a nested collection. So for those that don't know, you can have multiple collections and you can have one collection that references other collections. Um, this could be tags on a blog. This could be sizes of a product. Well, actually, you know, we won't get into e-commerce, but the point is you can reference those things. The, the issue is that once you use that source collection in a collection list, and then you want to reference those sub-collections, well, you only get five of those. And I'm actually, I'm not 100% sure of what the limits are. I think I thought they increased them. I don't know. But the point is they've increased those to 10. And well, what's the point and, unless you can reference those things? Emily gave me a cheeky little comment on my post and gave me a set of eyes. Now, I think they're gonna announce the increase, which I very, very, very much welcome. I think this is the biggest reason why I'm apprehensive to uh, refer Webflow onto some of my clients, because if they have anything remotely complicated when it comes to CMS and collections, check my mic again it keeps cutting out even remotely complex database structure interconnecting databases and i'm like you know what don't do it you can do it with a workaround like fin suite uh cms nested cms but that's all after the page loads and you've heard me talk about this many many times that having stuff load in after the page loads SEO doesn't give a crap about JavaScript. Sometimes it chooses not to even load it. So you're missing out on loads of SEO juice by nesting those collections using a JavaScript solution like CMS nesting. Anyway, point is I look forward to uh, some increased limits on the nested collection. We get a new dashboard for uh, usage, which is great. Um, people want more clarity on that apparently. But now we get to the big elephant in the room, which is bandwidth limits. Now they've reduced them hugely uh, for on all of the plans they've reduced them. So on basic plans, you're reduced from 50 gig to 10 gig. On CMS plans, you're reduced to 200 gig to 50 gig. And business plans, which is the biggest uh, kick in the teeth, 400 to 100 gig. Now these limits are quite generous um, for hobbyists, for independent designers, for small businesses. But when you start to get to business levels, those I've seen tweets even today, people being booted out of the business plan, urged to go into the enterprise plan, which I've heard, I've not had any experience in these things. I've heard them to be 15, 10, 15,000. I think they flex the pricing a little bit depending on your specific usage because they're dealing with you one-on-one. -on -one. But the point is the business plan here is the most worrying because I'm working on currently working on a website where uh, I think we are on the business plan and we are using 300 gig. Now, um, we now need to probably move on to the enterprise plan or do some serious re moving around of images, trying to reduce page loads and just removing 
a lot of the download from Webflow as possible to try and get under that 100 gig limit. Okay, editing Sam here, and I'll be honest, I missed this uh, in my initial kind of understanding and reading of the article. Sue me, I'm dyslexic, I miss this stuff. However, it doesn't really change a lot of these thoughts that were happening in my head anyway. So just to let me know that they do offer incremental updates to the business bandwidth. So if you need a little bit more, they provide bolt-ons, which for the first two, for the 50 gig bolt-on and the 100 gig bolt-on, um, they offer an increase in CMS limits, which is nice. The only thing I don't know is that it says we are also releasing two new add-ons for more bandwidth. Now, I don't know if the 200, 300 and 400 were already available and these are two new ones to sort of incrementally get you to those uh, to that 200 limit. I'm not too sure. Anyway, back to the episode. That is the, that's the elephant in the room here. They've given us a lot of, of great things, but the bandwidth is one of those things that really screws a lot of people over, not just in Webflow, but in AWS. Um, with all of these platforms, bandwidth is one of those hidden things that people don't really think about. Now, if you don't know what bandwidth is, it's the downloading and uploading of data through your website. If someone lands on your website, they have to download all of those files and they are and that counts towards your bandwidth limit now if you save those files if you don't update your website in three years and people keep coming back who have been there before then those assets will be cached depending on the settings of that person's browser but that exchange of data costs you bandwidth and pe uh, business owners know this or at least uh, starting to go into enterprise owners know this more than anyone that they've got to keep an eye on their bandwidth because they want speed, they want efficiency, and want to keep their costs low. So in a nutshell here, and I'll go on to what I wish I'd said in my previous video um, in a bit. In a nutshell here, they're really satisfying the independent designers, the very in, like small companies, independent designers, hobbyists. This is fine. For, for a lot of those people they're not going to push these limits but for a business for on, those on the business plan they are being pushed into that enterprise category which we all know is this place where webflow put their shiny big shiny uh new products um and try they're making they're, this is their lifeblood the enterprise plan for sure they could have thousands of us hobbyists using webflow for free but they're going to make their money up in the enterprise and they're trying very hard i think to push those people up into the enterprise and by luring those hobbyists which uh webflow is a great tool for they're almost grooming those uh, early adopters and those people who work as an independent, hoping that they will then sell that on to their clients. Maybe some underhand tactics going on here, but it, it comes down to that aggressive nature that Webflow have. If you are a hobbyist, if you are a small business, very small business, I mean, if you're on a CMS plan or even a basic plan, I think you've got nothing to worry about. If you are on a business plan, look forward to probably more ways they're going to try and push you into the enterprise solution. I really do think Webflow is a, an expensive option to use. And to get back into what I wish I'd said on my previous uh, episode, I enjoyed the fact that everything's an all-in-one solution, that you get the hosting and CMS and the website builder all-in-one. It wasn't the no-code aspect because that's been done before by many other companies, Dreamweaver being one of the first. But it's that SaaS solution where it's all up there, you don't have to worry about anything, you just design in the cloud and whatever. Once you get over that, once you start learning about hosting, once you start to look at that export website option and you think, hmm, we, we could save a lot of money by exporting our website and uploading it somewhere else. It, I start to wonder what the benefits are to a tool like Webflow because you're paying for all this beautiful stuff, which does suit people. People love that. People do use that. But then once you get over that and you want to fragment your data, you're getting data from all of these different sources. Maybe you've got an Airtable database. Maybe you've got um, some Zapier function. Well, actually, you'll have Zapier functions firing off because you need to get that data in the CMS of Webflow to be able to use it properly um, and benefit from backend uh, rendering and things like that. When you start to get into that world and you start to have to have systems, Zapiers, uh, external libraries, pulling all this data in, like modifying stuff and, 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 and whatever, that's when it starts to be like, well, what are you actually using 
Webflow for? And it's probably the designer. It's probably the designer, let's be honest. A lot of the people I speak to are designers who love the design aspect. They don't really understand that Webflow are offering CMS and, and hosting things like that, that, that. I think to most people that's just natural, that's normal, but it's not, it's a separate thing and you, you pay for all of these things separately. So it becomes a very hard thing to recommend and even more so for businesses as they start to pay all this money for you know a probably very hacked together website using lots of libraries to bypass a lot of the limitations that Webflow have. And if you do want me to look into your enterprise website, I'm happy to do so and see what hacky um, limits your the, the designers have bypassed to make Webflow work for your enterprise website. I sure as hell hope it's um, using the, you know, let's say raw, default capabilities of Webflow, but then I can't um, understand why you'd pay 15 grand for that website, you know, on a monthly basis. I don't know what the prices are. So bolted on to there, my kind of overall general thoughts on, on Webflow and, and where I think it's in a weird sticky situation at the moment. Really excited for a lot of the features coming out, like the page builder, um, but I question why you would be anything other than a business plan, but now I can see that you're being forced into an enterprise plan if you are on a business plan. It's becoming very costly to run a Webflow website. I don't necessarily um, recommend it for all my clients because it's a cost. If they're willing to do those costs, then I'm happy to you know, build their website for them, but I look for other solutions. Hope that was clear. Um, like I say, everyone kept asking me for, the, for my take on this sort of stuff. It further emphasizes my confusion on where to place Webflow, where exactly they're going to, and it being, let's call it the Rolex of um, you know website solutions. Pay an extortion amount for a lot of conveniences, which if you are happy to pay for those things, then go for them. But there are cheaper options out there, uh, not necessarily better because Webflow's UX is chef's kiss, I'll give them that. Um, yeah, like, subscribe if you haven't already. Until next time, happy no coding. <laughs>